Praise the Lord. First and Second Timothy, there are, there are two different letters written at two different times. First, at the very beginning of Timothy, he was in Ephesus, Ephesians church, and he needed help with as far as encouragement, build up, recognize that he could be the leader of it. And during that time, Paul was out traveling, building more, church, more churches. Paul was a, an apostle, a founder of building churches. But in Second Timothy, that second letter, there's, there's nowhere does it say the distance between the writing of First Timothy and Second Timothy, two different letters. The second letter was written when Paul was in prison, and it looked like that was it for Paul. He was guilty, going to be uh, crucified or going to be killed and uh, executed for the cause of Christ. It didn't look like he was going to get out of it. He didn't get out of it. He actually gave, I like to say, Second Timothy is like, is like Paul's last will and testament um, as far as the church goes and the built up of the church. So it's going to take me two weeks to get First and Second Timothy out. I was hoping to be able to do it all at one, but I, I don't think it would be fair because there's such leadership principles and important items in the church that all of us need to be able to walk through. And I want you to receive this message as if you're Timothy. Timothy was a young man, and the young man in the scriptures was right about bar mitzvah age, which is about a 15-year-old, and when, when he first started helping out Paul, some even thought Timothy could have been, uh, or have even said that he may have been adopted by Paul because of his age being so young, even pre-bar mitzvah at 15 years old, could have been 12, 13 years old when he started in the ministry, but he had a lineage of faith. He, Paul says, don't forget the genuine faith that is in you that was in your grandmother, and in your mother, and now that faith is in you by the laying on of my hands for the work of the ministry. So he had this incredible childlike faith to be able to help people out with the word of God. But this right here, First and Second Timothy, let us not doubt that this was all about legacy. Everybody say legacy. Three items I want you to capture here. Number one, it's the establishment of church leadership. He began to show church leadership and teach church leadership. Number two is Paul's instruction, instructing us to be able to be uh, focused on legacy of ministry. And then number three, Timothy was going to be the next generation of ministers. And so here in this church, at Center Church, our focus is to be able to train our children up in the way they should go from cradle to career. What's happening inside the children's church this very moment it's happen are we all on the camera? Are we okay with the camera? And what's happening with the children's church this very moment is that the kids inside the children's church are, are actually learning about becoming the next and, and being trained about becoming the next generation ministries at Center Church. From our grade school, our junior high, our high school, our young adults, which is college and career, those of you that are here, it doesn't matter that you didn't go through the children's church or what have you. You have the opportunity to be the next generation ministry. This is a legacy work. And what's beautiful about this work is not only was it founded by a husband and wife back in the late 80s, early 90s that were legacy minded. It continued where you have even Pastor Richardson, who's still with us. His children are all in the ministry and we can see legacy go on. I myself and my wife, my father and I started a church before my wife and I even met. We started doing the ministry in San Benito that eventually became Faith Pleases God Church that's in Harlingen. My dad and I built and planted that church. When he passed away, I became the senior pastor of the church in preparation for the legacy. I put my, my younger brother, who was a producer in television, wasn't a preacher at all. My younger brother, Kevin, who is now Pastor Kevin Ortiz, put him through Bible school and get him prepared for him to take up the ministry. And today, he's 19 years senior pastor of Faith Pleases God Church in Harlingen. It's a legacy. Amen? Come on, give God praise. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so we have to be focused on legacy. What's next? When I look at your children and I see this little baby right here, so precious, you know, I want, I'm, I'm looking forward. I'm of that age that I'm going to get a chance to see her grow up. And I, God grace me, I'll see her get married and have children of her own. I know, Daddy, you don't want to talk about that right now. That's okay. It's okay. She's still young. That's all right. But we want to be able to walk alongside 
to make sure that she grows up in the cares and the concerns of the word of God. And she's protected and has all the nutrients of the word inside her that mom and dad have the tools that they need to be able to raise up their children. As the word says, raise up your child into the way they should go. When they're old, they will not depart from it. God wants all of our children to be able to grow that way. And that's what happened with Timothy. Timothy was a spiritual son <laughs> he was walk right in front of me. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something. Timothy was a spiritual son of the Apostle Paul. And here the Apostle Paul was about to, about to relinquish this in 2 Timothy, about to give it, over, give it over to Timothy. So it's such a uniqueness that's here. So I want us to capture this. I say all this for you to understand this. On what has God purposed for you as leaders in Center Church? Anybody here could be a leader of Center Church. Anybody here can operate in leadership of Center Church. But there are qualifications according to First and Second Timothy that we have to live by. According to the Word of God, it tells you how to be a deacon and an overseer. These two right here are head deacons. They help provide oversight. They help identify those that are good for volunteering to help in certain areas of the ministry, the leadership. They work directly with my wife and I, and they're able to... To help in that area, this is a gentleman that's the head of a prison ministry. There's uh, elders that are helping me with, with ministry and helping out. We have intercessory prayer, people in leadership intercessory prayer. We have uh, television producers in the back. We have children's church directors. Pastor Richardson oversees the hold, elder over all the children's ministry. I mean, if you think about it, all of this is all about leadership. And if you're not holding a leadership position, it's not because of me. It's because of you. Because Timothy, like others, could have walked away from Paul. But instead, he stayed with Paul, receiving the letters, receiving the instruction. Say, I want to be able to be utilized and be called up to be able to be used in the kingdom of God. God wants to use you in the kingdom of God. Tell that person next to you, God wants to use you in the kingdom of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 and 7, it says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from good conscience, from sincere faith, from which some have strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. He starts talking about, he says, look, I want you to understand the commandment of the ministry, of entering into the ministry, is about love. Everybody say it's about love. The whole purpose of ministry is about love. Love your neighbors. Do good to people. Feed the poor. Take care of the widows. Take care of the orphan. We got to recognize how to be able to love each other. You got to love on each other. It's all about love. So write these three things down. Number one, you got to have a pure heart in ministry. He tells Timothy, you got to have a pure heart. You got to have, number two, good conscience. That means you, not only do you have a pure heart, but your mind is pure. Your mind is, you've got a good kind. You're not doing anything with evil intent. And number three, you have to be sincere in your faith. Ultimately, these three things saying you don't have a hidden agenda. Y'all like people with hidden agendas? No. Well, neither did Jesus. And you know what he would do? He'd expose those hidden agendas. And let me tell you something. When you got a work of the ministry that's guided by the Holy Ghost, somebody comes with a hidden agenda, it rises up. It don't take them long to figure it out. We had a, a guy come into the church with a whole intention to split the church one time, to split this church. He came, whole intention was to figure out how to meet people, everything, so he could go start his own church, split the church. That hidden agenda was completely exposed, and it ended up devastating his family devastated his finances, devastated his business. He went through hard struggles. He went through all this stuff. And he just said, man, this thing just doesn't work. Because you got to understand, you're not playing with people. You're playing with God. And God don't play. Everybody say, God don't play. Come on, God does not play. So when you come with hidden agendas, it, you won't be long. I heard stories of other people that came into the church over here and other churches, not just here, but other churches. And they tried to figure out how they can kind of pull position and make them. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. But if you come with a pure heart, pure conscience, 
You're doing it for the purpose of love. And your focus is to be sincere in faith. I, I want to be able to help carry the load. I want, I want to help teach people and minister to the people. I want to help families out. I want to feed the poor. You know what will happen? This ministry will open up like a beautiful flower and will decorate you and help propel you into the call that God has for you. Every one of you have a call of God. It doesn't mean you have to be the pastor or the preacher. It doesn't mean you have to be a worship singer or a musician. It doesn't mean you even have to be a greeter. But it does mean that God has a purpose for you in the ministry. And we're all will be benefactors of your call. Every single one of you. Now you can ask anybody that's around me. It don't take me long once they, I identify who they are and some of the leaders come and say, hey, pastor, take a look at this family. Is there something we could do with them? And there's an area I'd like to put them in there. The, the word that comes out of my mouth is let's do it. Let's do it. You called it? Let's do it. Am I right, Joey? Let's do it. What do you need? Joey says he wants to go out. He says, man, I just feel I want to do evangelism and go out there. I said, what do you need? I need some books and flyers. Okay. Well, let's go get them. He says, some flyers. He actually started with water. There's another one over here that gets water with ice. And there's, there's things that we will, we will empower you because that's the purpose of the ministry. So we went out. I got, I got them all these books that we had back over here just waiting. Then we ordered another 2,000 of these books. And then he found my contact. And one day I come walking in and he had 5,000 of these books delivered to the church. I looked at him. I, he thought he was going to be in trouble. I said, praise the Lord. You just graduated from one class to the other. Now I don't have to order the books. He knows where to get them. Don't worry about it. God keeps taking care of it. Amen? Amen. You got Spanish and English and everything. It's awesome. He says, I need flyers. I said, well, design it. Give it to me. I go out and I get pay, pay, pay whatever it takes to get the flyers, the cards, whatever is that's needed. So whatever it is that God's calling you to do, do it with a pure heart, good conscience, sincere in faith. Because it's used for the work of the ministry, for the edifying and building up of the body of Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, a few verses over, it says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He said, God enabled me. God counted me faithful. That's important that God will empower you. God finds you faithful. And then he'll put you right into the ministry. Anybody can have a ministry. If you have a good heart, good cause. You can say to yourself, well, I don't feel like I'm called to the ministry. Now you're called to the ministry one way, shape, form, or fashion. You could be folding envelopes. I mean, folding letters and stuffing envelopes. You could be vacuuming. You could help with the yard ministry. You can help with making phone calls. I need people to answer the phone. I mean, there's people here that, that came to church. They, they're members of the church right now because somebody answered the phone. They call all these other places. Nobody answered. Nowadays, you don't get very many people answering the phone. Are you kidding me? That's a ministry in itself. Somebody has to answer the phone. When I got in the office here, I said, I want to make sure that phone's answered all the time, as much time as I can. I got to get people in here. I, I'll get people in here answering the phones, even though nobody's calling, as long as they're there by the phone. I don't care if nobody's calling, but I do care if somebody calls and there's nobody there. That means more to me, right? Because it's about when that person calls. When that person calls, you never know what kind of needs they're going to have. You don't, you don't hear what happens, what I hear that happens. If someone just got beaten. Someone got thrown out in the street. Somebody got arrested. Somebody is, is hungry. There's a, a widow that's out in the street. There's a, there's a toilet that's not working. There's, a, there's an issue that, that's taking place inside their home. And if someone's not there to answer the call, how can you really minister? And some of you might say that's... Uh, a little extreme. No. It takes all types. This is a body. Everybody say, we're a family. Come on, say, hello. Estamos la familia. Come on, say, la familia. Everybody say it. Say it like a gangster. La familia. We're la familia. We're the family. Did you notice one of the networks on TV is called La Familia? La Familia. If you look at that app, there's a whole Spanish network called La Familia. 
I founded that work, that network in 2001 on my face in the front when I was losing everything when it came to television. Everything was trying to be taken away. The enemy was trying to take away everything. And I received a fax that all these stations and everything was about to just take everything away through one satellite. They were moving everything from one satellite to the other. And I had a network that my father had founded called Family Educational Television Network, FETV. And so I had just received the, the fax, the final straw that said, that's it. We're not going to keep carrying it just because they thought they found another network that would be better. And I was having this huge ministry come in and minister. I had the house completely packed. And I just get this fax machine before I'm about to take the stage. I get this notification before I'm about to take the stage to, to, uh, to turn the, the, the pulpit over to the man of God that came in as a traveling minister. And I got the worst news ever. And I get up there and I said, Lord, I don't know how we're going to do this, but let's go. I turned the church, the ministry over to the, to the guy for him to minister that night. I got on my face in the front. And I started asking the Lord, what do I need to do? And I'm listening to the preacher preach. And he starts preaching the message about how Pharaoh took the straw away from the Israelites for them to make bricks. And they made bricks with no straw. And the Lord told me, you don't let the enemy dictate where you're going to go. I am your God. I will take care of you. If we have to make bricks without straw, we're going to do it. And that touched inside me. Amen. He says, this is what you're called to do. I put this inside you. Don't worry about it. It's my ministry, not your ministry. You just do as I tell you to do. I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And he starts downloading instructions. You're going to change the name of the network from Family Educational to La Familia Network. You're going to build it up with Spanish entertainment programming that's dealing with the family. You're going to teach family values and Christian in nature. You're going to give the word. You'll have some preachers, but a lot of the preaching is going to be fishing shows and cooking shows and and hunting shows and home shows and all these other shows that people, novelas and all that. I want you to do it all for the, for the family. So I meant God's downloading this thing that I've never heard anything like it. The following day, I came into the office with a whole new fire in me, started making the phone calls. Make a long story short, 12 months later, I'm honored with an award as the most influential Hispanic in cable television, the fastest growing Spanish television network in the United States, third to Telemundo. They gave me a big, they gave us a big six story advertisement of La Familia Network in Times Square in New York City saying, welcome, New York City cable, welcome La Familia Television Network. Only God will do something like that. What the enemy means for bad, God turns it around into something good. And where they took me out, where they took the network off was just a fraction of what God ended up giving us. We ended up cable television all over the United States. God will do something great when you're called to the ministry. He's going to take care of you. You just have to have a good heart. He says, I put you into the ministry he says, because he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. That's something that people wrestle with. I don't think God can use me because I used to be a drug addict and I used to be an alcoholic and I used to be a dancer and I used to be a liar and I was a dr drug dealer or I was, I was a criminal, I was in prison or I, whatever those things that the enemy says you can't do it. God wants to use it. I believe God likes to take your past and almost wear it like a badge of honor. Look what I did for this guy. Look what I did for this girl. Look what I did for that family. Look what I did for this family. You know, David took down Goliath, but he didn't take Goliath until after he said, I took down the bear and I took down the lion. Who's this undefiled Philistine that thinks he can curse God? I'm going to take his head. Not only did he kill Goliath with, with a sling, killed Goliath with a sling. He chopped his head off by his own sword, and then he paraded this head all in front of the other Philistines. God knows how to brag. Ooh, ooh. God is a bragger. <laughs> Huh. 
Amen. 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 Don't ever let the enemy say you're not worthy. Don't ever let him say that. Don't ever let the enemy say that. Those in the sin nature are guilty through ignorance. What does ignorance mean? Lack of knowledge. You're guilty through ignorance. Once you got knowledge, things change. Watch this. He says the, the antidote to ignorance is the knowledge of God. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't let the enemy say you're not worthy. Don't let the enemy try to convince you that you're not capable. All you need is the knowledge of God, and that's what we're here for. We're here to give you the knowledge of God. We want to prepare you with the knowledge of God. Because God wants to use every single one of you in the ministry. Look, the, the ministry, this is, a, this is a fact, okay? First of all, my wife and I have almost 40 years in ministry. She's already been in ministry over 40 years, and it's, it's only because she's more mature than I am. I didn't use the word older. She is a cougar. I am. I was just a little puppy dog, and she came with her. Ow. She came with her with her Mustang sports car, and I was riding my little bicycle, the little ringer, bling 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 bling. You know, I had the little streamers on the handlebars. You know, and one of those little spinning wheels. You know, those spinning wheels that on the front, and she comes riding by me. Hello, little boy. And she batted her eyes, and I, don't want to go. I was like, "That one, me." I jumped right in, both feet first. I made her mine. <laughs> it's a true story. I'm only kidding. According to me. That's the way it's painted in my mind. Let me tell you how far off I am. You tell me if I'm far off. I'm 15. She's... And... Uh, I have a mic. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do y'all want to hear this? I'm 15. She's... Can I say it? <laughs> and... And I was invited by my aunt to go to a private art class. And so when I get to the art class, she's there. What kind of car did you have? A Renault. A Renault? She had a Renault. That's foreign. Ooh. You know what I had? A Schwinn. I rode my bike. I rolled up like a gangster. I go inside the art class, and I see this beautiful blonde. Oh. Huh? She was in a pool of about six 95-year-olds. So. <laughs> they, were, they were all winter Texans, you know. At least to a 15-year-old, that's what in the, everybody looked. You look 95 to a 15-year-old. <laughs> and I positioned myself behind her. Now, in my mind, she wanted me to get in the car. When we later on got married, she said, I didn't even know you were in the art class. I said, Lord, deliver her from that lying okay, spirit. From my point of view, here Go. I am. Go ahead. Older, driving a car, had my own car. I worked at Sears where your aunt worked at. She had a she job and everything. Yeah, I'm not looking at a 15-year-old. With half his hair or something, he was telling me half his hair would shave her off or something. In a riding, yes, he was riding his bike. Hello. 
with a lollipop. That's all in my mind. Michael, I'm telling you, that's what it was. I had a lollipop. You know the circle I, one? I didn't even know he existed. But you know, a 15 year old, you know, she wanted me to get she wanted me to get in her car. It's just the way it was, my reality. <laughs> 40 years. Been in the ministry for 40 years. We've been married 37 years. She already completed 40 years. I'm at 39. Next year will be 40 years in the ministry. You got 40 years into anything, you know a thing or two. You know something. And we're talking 40 years nonstop. Nonstop. We've never stopped doing ministry. What? I'm 44. How does that happen? I'm only 45. I know, right? I'm, I'm being kind, honey. You're the one that wants to throw all that age stuff out there. You know, I'm just... Okay, so... <laughs> So 40 years of ministry, you know a thing or two. You got a little bit in, under your belt, and you know the attitudes and personalities that are in churches, the history that goes in there. And this is nonstop ministry. How to build a church, how to work, how to, how to get people where they are. You, you, you have a problem. What is the problem? We, we're going to guide you out of that problem, and we're going to get you into your solution according to the Word of God. What I've learned in these 40 years, it's not like I have the answers. I just have the God who has all the answers. That Bible right there, God put all the secrets of the universe in that book. And I have 40 years of experience knowing it knows more than I do. He knows more than me. God knows more than I could ever know. The Word of God has all the answers of whatever your going through. The Word of God has those answers for you. I want you to see this. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7, I'm seeing the time that I have. I got five minutes to go because I'm going to split this into two different messages because I want to give you I want to give you something. You know what? Let's, let's wrap with those last three points. You got those three points up there? You'll take a picture of that if you want to. Don't let the enemy say you're not worthy. Those in sin nature, are guilty through ignorance. This is a powerful statement. You're not guilty by fault. I want you to understand what grace means. Grace means you're forgiven without you doing anything. You don't have to crucify yourself on the cross. You don't have to walk on your knees two miles to get to church. You don't have to whip yourself with a belt. No. You are innocent because of ignorance. But once you have the knowledge of God, once you receive the knowledge of God, you understand that when you do sin, ask him to forgive you, and he's faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. Every sin you commit, every problem you do. Well, you say, well, pastor, well, how many times will he forgive me of the same sin? Well, he gives us a clue. He tells the disciples, he says, I want you to forgive 70 times 7 a day. So if he tells the disciples to forgive 70 times 7, how many more do you think, I mean, how many, how many times do you think you can commit a sin in one day? <laughs> you, you find yourself in some problems. When you begin to walk in the repentive life, when you start walking in the repentive life, everybody say repentive life. See, there's two different natures you can have. You can have a sin nature or you can have a repentive nature. When you're in the sin nature, you're sinning because of ignorance. But now that you understand the repentive nature, you're forgiven because he paid the price for you on Calvary's cross. All you have to do is say, Jesus, forgive me. Everybody say it right now. Say it again, Jesus, forgive me. Whatever sins you've committed, you say, Lord, forgive me. When you have a repentive nature, the moment you commit the sin, you ask the Lord to forgive you, he forgives you. He's faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. Whatever problems that you have, whatever situation you go through, please let the knowledge of God let you know that you are forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Tell the person next to you, you're forgiven. 
What you did last night, just ask the Lord to forgive you. You're forgiven. He needs you to be forgiven because he wants to use you. He wants to transform your community. So he has to forgive you. He died on the cross so you could be forgiven because he knew you could not walk away from it unless if he forgives you. And it comes a time that you no longer want that sin anymore. There comes a time that you no longer want to continue to do what you're doing. comes a time that you don't want to do those things that you keep repenting from. comes a time. So Jesus has this awesome scripture. In the book of Ephesians, he says that Jesus washed us with the washing of the water of the word. This is why we need leaders in the ministry. We need preachers of the gospel, declarers of the word. You have more word in you than, than the average person who's never been saved. And we need people to help share that word and to give that word to the community. So we want to develop you. And we want to prepare you so that way you can change and transform lives. Everyone stand to your feet, if you will. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't know what your challenge is. I don't know what you're going through. You don't have to tell me. I don't take confessions. I let all of them go to Christ. But you ask him to forgive you of all your sins, he will. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Let's go before the Father and let's ask him to forgive us. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we ask you right now to see the hearts of every person that's here. You know the challenges that they're going through. So, Father, we ask you to receive them forgiven. Repeat after me Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Wash them all away. Come live inside me. Make me a new person. Baptize me with your Holy Spirit. I receive you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior of my life. Accept me as your child, as I accept you as my Father. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. say we are so blessed because we have I think we have the most genuine pastors you know they're so God sharing and God giving and such an example for us all you know I, I love them with all my heart because they have done nothing but allow us to grow in the word you know because you'll hear it but you'll share it Many times you feel you're called to serve, but you don't step up. And that's okay, because everything has a season. You know, reach out to someone that's in need. And I know all of us have that coworker that needs God in their life, or that share their problems with you. Tell them about God. Tell them what God has done in your life and how great He is. It's not easy walking in God's walk. You know, he brings us into new seasons. And scripture is one of the most important things that we need to hold on to. And it's spending time with God, quiet time with God. Not, no music, no words, just you and God listening to God, looking for his voice, seeking him. You know, the most amazing thing is grace. And I love that word. <laughs> because Jesus Christ is a source of power. That's how we get our power is through his grace. Because following him is not easy, but his rewards are great. Remember, when you endure in him, you will reign with him. When you die with him, with him so be ready 
in season and out of season because he's seeking for you he's seeking you so just step up and share his word because that's why we're here today amen let me pray for you guys thank you heavenly father for this wonderful day that you have made bless your mighty name thank you for your grace your kindness and your mercy lord thank you for your wisdom and for guiding us i declare life on everyone here lord. the lord bless you and help keep you safe may his face shine upon you and give you grace give them your strength and grant them your favor everywhere they go let your light shine through them lord. in jesus name if you want to meet Pastor Lisa, Pastor.